podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. Welcome to the 10-12, the podcast that covers all 14 teams in the Big 12 Conference, soon to be 16, plus Colorado, Arizona, Arizona State, and Utah. We are the flagship show of the 1012 Network. Find every show on the network at 1012network.com. Plus, we are partners with Sports Social, Europe's biggest sports podcast network. I'm your host, Philip Slavin. Thank you for joining us today. Softball season is coming to a close. This is the it, this is a huge week. This is one of my favorite times of the sports calendar because there's going to be softball on all day for four straight days. Like it's, it's incredible. It's wonderful. It's, it's not, it's not, it's right there below like March Madness. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. I cannot wait. I cannot wait. Uh, so joining me to break down the big 12, who's in the regionals, who didn't make it. Oh, I know he's got as much energy about, about what we're going to talk about today. He is part of Sons of UCF. He is the host of In the Circle. He is the voice of UCF softball. I I I feel like I'd had 10 more titles for you, but I can't think of them off the top of my head. He is Eric well, mention, Lopez. Me, well, mention the one that's most important is the uh, best uh, bracketologist out there. Proven, as people have posted, uh, kind of lapped the field there. Uh, so, you know, it was good. I wasn't perfect, although I would argue the committee was the one that wasn't perfect. I think I was fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, look, I, somebody po- compared all the different bracketologies. Yours was the most accurate. You're the only one who had Oklahoma State as a top eight seed as a super regional host in your final bracketology on the day that the seeding was announced. Bravo. Bravo. This is, this is I know you. why you're a voice for the Big 12. This is this kind of stuff right here. Uh, uh, well, i got to do a better job, evidently, in a couple of things. But, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, we'll get to the Oklahoma State portion of it, but I remember you texting me like, oh, everybody has Oklahoma State. I'm like, you're the only one. I'm like, yeah, so? <laughs> I, I know what I'm doing. That's the difference. I know what I'm doing. Nobody else does. They're all caught up in the SEC propaganda there, but you know that's okay. It, look, the propaganda machine is strong. It is. It is a runaway train going down a hill, and which uh, is fine. That's fine. But uh, mathematically, thirteen SEC teams cannot be a top eight seed. Just so you know, you, I, just, I'm not. I don't know. I don't know. I you know math is subjective isn't that, is that right uh also joining us today she is sorry Leah. the trash <laughs> yeah don't queen. forget about me <laughs> we'll be we'll be bringing Leah in here in about 20 minutes after we finish this intro <laughs> that's hilarious Leah nelson joining us as she has all season <laughs> Leah. thanks guys <laughs> i'll be here too <laughs> we, look uh Okay, we're we're gonna break stuff down. Let's let's just dive in because I know I have thoughts. I know Eric has thoughts. What let's let's start with the positive. Let's build some positivity before we dive into the angry f- old man shouts at cloud kind of vitriol that I think both Eric and I have. Oklahoma State is one of the three Big Twelve teams who is a top eight seed and hosting. Texas gets the number one overall, no surprise there. Oklahoma gets the two. Uh, Eric, I think you agree that has a lot to do with Oklahoma winning the Big Twelve tournament and Tennessee, who got the three, losing out of the SEC tournament. So Oklahoma gets the two seed, which I do think is deserved there as well. Oklahoma State got the five seed, uh, and then Baylor will be the two seed at Louisiana. UCF uh, is uh, is headed to, as I mentioned, Tallahassee, the Florida State Regional. Those are the only five Big 12 teams who got in. That's it. That's it. We'll talk about that in a second. Well, uh, go ahead, Eric. Go ahead. Yeah, let's start the positives. Let's be positive. Yes. Because yes. I because I do think, I, I you know, we always get caught up in the negative stuff, and I understand that. There's always critiques and things. I will say this, and I just, you know, I tweeted this out, uh, prior, you know, on Monday, which is, I think this was one of the best jobs the committee has done recent in years as far as seeding the tournament, in particular the top 16. Case in point, Texas and Oklahoma. Those are clearly the two best teams in the country all year. The it, it, Sometimes you don't have to overthink this stuff. Same with Oklahoma State. I felt Oklahoma State was a lock for the top eight once they won Bedlam. And then what happened was they lost to BYU in the opening round of the Big 12 tournament, which I was there. It wasn't pretty, I grant you that. But because they really no showed it, and Kenny Gaskin wasn't too worried about it, which is funny. Uh, 
But everybody started freaking out about it. Oh my god, the RPI drop. Oh, that's going to cost him a top eight seed. And we do this every year when in reality a one loss does not affect your seeding that much that people think. And oh, by the way, BYU is a top 50 team. It's not like they lost to the 100th ranked team in the RPI. So I'm going to read you Oklahoma State's wins because I was blown away that I was the only person left that thought Oak State was a top 18, considering Oklahoma State has two wins over Texas, two wins over Oklahoma. Those are the top two RPI teams. They also have a win against Florida. On the road at Florida, your new SEC tournament champ, who's the four seed in the tournament. And oh, by the way, they have a win at UCLA when they crushed them on opening week. Where are the Bruins seeded? Six, right? Yeah, six. You're not, you're not going to have a team that has those wins out of the top eight. No way. No, people are always focusing on the negatives too. And like, I mean, it's easy to be like, well, Oklahoma State lost to Iowa State twice. But did people hear what the teams that Eric was just reading off? Like those are insane teams, high ranked, high RPI. It it makes sense why Oklahoma State is, uh, is ranked higher. And I'm proud to say that I know Eric because – he had the best bracket. I was hyped when I saw that on Twitter or X. Sorry. Uh, Thank you. I, I heard the new nickname we're calling is Twix. So it's the, it's the in-between name for it. So we can just, we can roll with that. Twix. <laughs> Twix. It's pretty funny. <laughs> best of both worlds. Uh, more of the better, less of the latter. Uh, Leah, I, I do want to talk about the Big 12. Let, let's just, we're going to sidetrack here just for a minute. Big 12 tournament, uh, BYU got the win over Oklahoma State. Oklahoma uh, knocked off Texas in their final season. Uh, did you, you got to watch some of that. A- any takeaways uh, from the Big 12 tournament from you, Leah, uh, including maybe, uh, I know you don't have to talk about the Iowa State Texas Tech game if you don't want to. That was an incredible no. game, except <laughs> for if you're an Iowa State fan or, or player. I just want to say, I think you jinxed it, Philip, when you texted. I think this one's over. <laughs> wow. Oh, I did. And I literally oh, I did. almost texted you back and was like, shut your mouth because you are putting bad juju in the air. It, I mean, okay, I'll just kind of recap the Iowa, Iowa State Texas Tech game. They looked so good coming out, and I was just frustrated because I'm like, I wish Iowa State could play like this all the time. But it was so fun to see that game go into extra, see Texas Tech fight back. Like, even though I was rooting for Iowa State, like, come on. That was one of the best games of the weekend, in my opinion. It, I mean, there were a couple 14-inning games in the SEC, but come on. that like it was, it was such a fun game, but the Big 12 tournament honestly kind of went how I – how I assumed it would go. I knew there'd be a bedlam hangover, like Eric mentioned in the podcast or in the episode before. Um, I knew BYU would come out. It was their first Big 12 tournament. Um, I was excited for Baylor getting their first win since when 2018. <laughs> so it just it was a great tournament. It went how I thought it would go. And to be honest, like it's kind of cool that Oklahoma won because it shows all of their fans that they're still in it and they could still win. Um, so we'll just see what happens as, as the tournament goes on. Eric, you were there. <laughs> I was there for every single one of those just a games. deep breath. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to defend Phillips. See, Leah, you jinxed it, but I offered Leah to come on the pregame show. I she was in the circle every day. Of the you Big did not tournament. every day. It was one no, time and I no, was at but work. That's my point, though. I offered you to come on. To mm-hmm. pro- talk Iowa State, Texas Tech. You did, you did. did but I, I was, not? you did. I was in the middle of some TikTok I was editing for work or something. <laughs> yeah, I should take that. That's on me because if I would, if you, I would have talked on. a little bit, uh huh. Right. You're right. All I was, I was asking was 10, 15 minutes. I was going to get both of you on the live shows, except <laughs> your two teams got knocked out in the opening round. Uh, we had a, you know, that's a deal, but. You're right. That that Texas Tech Iowa State game was the best game of that Big Twelve tournament. Oh, I was there. It was so wild. Oh my goodness, it was wild. Uh, and and Kaylee Wyckoff was fantastic. I got a chance to talk to her. That was a huge win for Craig Snyder, Texas Tech. I thought at the time, anyway. Um, still is. Uh, but yeah, that was a fun one. You know, Kansas, Houston. I was. I, you know, the funny thing is those playing games on Wednesday were pretty good. Mm-hmm. Both one run games. UCF Baylor was a one run game. The semis was the disappointing part. Uh, with two blowouts, you know, with Oklahoma State losing to BYU, that kind of made it anticlimactic because obviously everybody was expecting Bedlam four maybe didn't happen, and then BYU had nothing. You know, they weren't going to beat Oklahoma a second time this year. 
Sooners were locked in. And then Baylor, my uh, Texas just unloaded on them uh, because Baylor used Binford against UCF the night before. So Big 12 title game was okay. It was good. It was a great atmosphere. The Big 12 was great to me and the show, by the way. We got all access there. It was fantastic. I'm definitely going back next year. You two better come next year. All right? I'll put it on the calendar. I had all this room in the booth, guys. We could have done shows from the booth. Oh. I'm look. I got three kids. <laughs> one of them. I don't. One of them so just I'll turned two. Calendar. Like I don't, you know. Okay, so Leo, Leo will be there next year. Uh, she's gone ahead. Uh, so we'll just go ahead and get her. We'll, she'll be back on the show and and out there with with Eric. So that'll be great. Okay. Yeah, Leah, definitely. You have no excuse. I mean, for, 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 <laughs> you're, you're right. You're right. You and I don't have. You know, neither one of us has kids or, no. or married. You know, all that stuff. No, so right. we can just hang out and have some fun at OKC for the Big Twelve tournament. Sounds like a blast to me. I'm putting it on my calendar right now. <sighs> I'm just gonna live vicariously through you guys. That's that's what I'm gonna do here. Just get a babysitter. <laughs> 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 Is that not how it works? <laughs> Uh, can you not just do that for a couple of days uh, he's not gonna comment on that he's not gonna comment so um all right well let's break down our uh our pauses let's break down the, the regionals uh in which our big 12 teams are in texas number one overall seed as we mentioned uh they have sienna northwestern and st francis they're northwestern the two seed in that region Ta- uh, eric uh, to me like i know everyone's kind of ranking uh, the different regionals by how easy or difficult they are. I mean, Northwestern, Northwestern's a, I mean, it's, it's a fine team, but I, I like, we don't typically see a one seed lose in their regional. I don't see a Texas losing in this regional. I don't see Texas having much of a struggle in this regional. I, I feel like it'll be a quick and easy three Oh, and, and they're on to supers. Should be. I mean, Northwestern scrappy. The draw hands are good coaches, but this is, I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're not a, they're a young team. I actually nailed three out of four teams in this bracket. Somehow I got Texas versus Siena correct, which is kind of nuts. But you look at Texas, I think the regional is a breeze. And it should be, by the way. They're the number one seed. Uh, that should not be the issue. The fascinating part is if you look at the pairings, they're paired up with the College Station Super Regional with Texas A&M. And the potential of a Texas-Texas A&M matchup, one more, you know, they're going to be conference members next year. So they, you know... Here we are, A and M and Texas paired up. They were paired up last year in a regional. Now they could, and potentially, be paired up in the supers. Although you know, there's a couple teams in that College Station, uh, certainly regionals, that may have something to say about that. But yeah, good draw for Texas. I think if they earn that number one seed, I know some Oklahoma fans were mad because they you know they beat them on Saturday night. But Texas's resume was way better. With that, that was already decided prior to that game. Yeah, one one game isn't going to change all that. Also, a uh, reminder, Texas State did already beat Texas A&M 4-3 in a midweek game in San Marcos earlier this season. So Texas State is is there in College Station with Penn State and University of Albany. Like, I think Texas A&M comes out of there, but I if you told me Texas State wins it, it wouldn't surprise me. No, it wouldn't. I think Mullins, they have a veteran group that's been to regionals. Uh, they'll push him. I, I think that goes at least to the full, if necessary, game seven. Yeah, I I, I agree with you there. Lee, any thoughts on on the on these uh, on Texas regional or the the College Station regional opposite them? Uh, just Texas I think it's going to be a breeze, but like you said Philip, like as it should be, they're number 1 overall. Um I wouldn't count Texas State out. I've been watching them, I've been following along. Um I'm really enjoying how Mullins is pitching. Um she and she's feisty and I love her Twitter. Um she has some great tweets, so you should follow her, follow along on her um if you haven't, but yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if uh Texas State pulled some out. Uh spicy mouthy pitchers in softball are uh the best when you're not playing against them. <laughs> when you can cheer for them from afar right. and not on the field against you. And right. It's quite good. Yeah. Look, look, Leah is our resident trash talk queen of the 1012 network. So she knows. She knows all about the uh, the quality of trash talk going on. Yes. Look, I, I you know, there's a, a story here of you know, Texas Texas AM is a potential super regional matchup. Oklahoma is the two seed. We'll talk about the region here in a second. Their potential uh, super regional matchup. Florida State, which is a storied uh, rivalry, I would say, in softball that we've seen many a time. I'll, I'll give the committee this: like, I don't think they, in, I don't think they necessarily intentionally made like move teams drastically as far as seeding to get pairings, but it certainly didn't hurt to have certain potential super regional pairings. Obviously, teams have to get out of their regionals, and I believe if I did the math today, on average, about 
you get about two to three regional upsets each season. There was a two year stretch where it was chalk the regionals, but most of the time you get about two or three a year. Um, could happen here with Florida State. Uh, they've got Auburn and UCF. We'll talk about that in a second. But Oklahoma, the two seed overall. They've got Boston. They've got Oregon. There's a fun little rivalry opportunity. Oregon uh, head coach, your former assistant in Oklahoma, and Cleveland State. Boston's been uh, an interesting team. It's, it's not the easiest. Like I, I think OU's coming out of this. Let me just preface before I say anything else. I think OU's coming out of their regional. I feel fairly confident in that. But they didn't get the easiest draw with Oregon and Boston there in that Norman regional with them. I agree, because I would rather play Northwestern in Oregon. Yeah. If I, right? And you mentioned, obviously, Missy Lombardi, longtime pitching coach under Patty Gasso, now the head coach at Oregon. Don't forget, her assistant... Sydney Romero for obviously the great player of Oklahoma coming back as well. So that is juicy storyline stuff. I had that matchup for like a month or two, so I'm happy about that. Boston, obviously, we had, I talked to Ashley Waters in the selection show, live show we did at D1 Supple. She was not happy. She was very candid about be, being sent to Oklahoma again. Felt they deserved a better draw than that. Uh, so she was very open about it. They got a young, great pitcher named Casey Ricard, who's a top 25 national player of the year candidate. Uh, so they're very good. They're very solid. But I kind of agree with Coach Waters. They got a tough draw here with Oregon and then Oklahoma. I actually think Boston has a shot with Oregon because Oregon's pitching is a little suspect this year, which is why I think Oklahoma is going to score a bunch of runs. But I'm interested to see how Ricard does against Oregon. But, yeah, I agree with you, Oklahoma. Too much firepower for Oregon. But I am intrigued to see how Lombardi tries to pitch against Oklahoma uh, and her mentor in Patty Gasso. I was going to say, I just, yes, it's a harder, harder um, group of uh, teams. But again, Oklahoma is a different animal when it comes to postseason. And I feel like they're going to kind of walk out of this one pretty easily. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I don't want to take anything away from Oregon and, and Boston, but especially Oklahoma coming off of that Big 12 championship win, I think it's going to be um, a pretty pretty easy time for them. I will note, Oklahoma has six losses on the season. Four of those have come at home. I do think sure. that new ballpark has been something that they haven't adjusted to completely. Again, I'm not picking them to lose their regional. <laughs> I'm just saying, saying, well, they're at home. That should be a guarantee. That has not been a guarantee this season. Four of their six losses have come in Love Field. Yeah, that's been very weird about that. And look, would it shock me if Oregon forced a game seven? No, I wouldn't. Because again, Lombardi knows that program inside out. And that's sometimes the, the, you know, if you wonder how is this run going to end for Oklahoma, sometimes it might end shockingly. Well, of someone that knows that program inside out might be the person that gets him out of there earlier than people think. I'm not doing picking that. I'm just saying <laughs> it, would, I'm, I'm, it wouldn't be shocking to me if it goes to a game seven because Oregon has talented athletes. Their pitching has been inconsistent, uh, which is why I think they've been underachieving this year. But they've got athletes. This was a super regional team a year ago that lost to Oklahoma State in Stillwater. So – it, they know what they're doing. I'm going to pick Oklahoma, but you're right. That, that's an interesting regional to monitor though, if, if, if we get those matchups. And Boston uh, is a, one of the best mid-major programs right now in the sport. Uh, perfect. If we can just talk about the Tallahassee Regional, which is opposite OU, Florida State, the host, uh, Auburn, UCF. Are you aware of this program? Uh, sneaky little Florida? I've heard of that program. Uh, I'm just glad somebody's talking out. Somebody else is going to talk about UCF on this show other than me. That's <laughs> I watched. I, I couldn't watch your show live. I had to come and like watch back later again. Like these things. I'm like sitting here, like keeping track of things on my phone while I'm hey. having dinner with the children. And I'm like, kids, don't be on your phone while you're eating dinner. No, pay attention to what you're doing. Dad is going to multitask. Uh, as long as you watched. As long as you watched. I did watch. Uh, and you got a little worried there. And I was a little worried as we were getting down to – we hadn't seen UCF and we hadn't seen, obviously we didn't see Texas Tech until I was reminded like, oh yeah, Florida State's going to host it. They didn't get Florida. They must be headed to Florida State for the third time in four years. Okay, let, so let's let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. Um, this obviously is because, because of the 400 mile rule. If you have a team within 400 miles of a host, they're going to ship them there. Great. Awesome. Understand why they've done that. No one should have to go to the same place and face the same teams over and over and over and over and over again. Like, I get the rule. And look, that for UCF fans, maybe it'll make it easier. They can make the trek to Tallahassee. That's awesome. 
I just like some of this, it makes for weird lopsided regionals, super lopsided, unbalanced regionals, because what we got to send this place this way. And I don't look, I'm going to be honest. We're going to talk about Texas Tech and, and the teams that got in over them here in a minute. I'm not 100 percent convinced that the 400 mile rule didn't have an effect on Texas Tech not getting in over, say, Indiana, who we're going to have a conversation about. I just, I, I, Florida Atlantic, Florida Atlantic. I kind of hate this for UCF to you, me both. Like you, you get a Florida state team who I think is good, but not great. So there is an opportunity there. You got to get past Auburn first, who has shown the ability to, to, to win some big games. It's a tough regional for Florida state, which you're the 15 seed. You, you're not good. You, you should have a tougher regional to me. So for Florida state end, I, like, I, I think I lean Florida State, but it wouldn't shock me if UCF got out of here, and it wouldn't shock me if Auburn got out of here either. All right, so that's a lot. That's a lot. Um, Sorry. <laughs> I agree. I, 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 I'll I start with this. I agree 100% with the 400-mile radius rule. This is an example of a joke that it is. It This is the third time in four years. This is the second time UCF and Auburn are going to play in a regional here. They played in 2021. So... Uh, the irony is this senior class, this heralded senior class for UCF's first regional is Tallahassee against Auburn. Their last regional is going to start against Auburn in Tallahassee. Um, so that's that. Here's what the, what transpired at why UCF's in Tallahassee. Florida Atlantic. You had Florida Atlantic, Florida Gulf Coast, UCF, as far as at-large teams. Well, excuse me, two at-larges. Florida Gulf Coast won the A-Sun automatic bid. All of them can bust to uh, Florida Gulf Coast and and UCF can bust to both Gainesville and Tallahassee. Florida Atlantic cannot. Florida Atlantic cannot bust to Tallahassee. That's above 400 miles. So when that Gainesville Regional popped up, it was pretty simple for FAU. If they were going to get into the NCAA tournament, they were going to find out right there. They were going to fly FAU to like, you know, you know, UCLA. It's not going to happen. So then they put FAU there, which I have my questions about that. And we'll get into that when we get to Texas Tech. They squeezed Florida Gulf Coast, who could have been a three seed to uh, in both of those regions, to a four seed. That was a, a hint to me that UCF, okay, you're going to Tallahassee. And, and I knew the Auburn matchup once Mississippi State was announced out west. But it is a stressful situation because I warned everybody, uh, the UCF people on the camp there is, if they're going to Tallahassee, it's going to be stressful because Florida State's in the back end of the seeding process. So it's a long wait, and it's a miserable feeling, Philip. I've been in the room with teams. There's not a worse feeling than not having your name, your team's name called, and we're like, oh, my goodness, we're on seed 11. We're in the 11th seed here. We're now on to the 12th regional. We're on to the third. Like, you're just – now you're getting – the blood pressure. Leah, I want you to speak about this because uh, it is not a fun experience from a player standpoint – the longer this drags out, and we'll get to this with Texas Tech, because I think they sir, they got sucker punched. It is a brutal situation when you're on the bubble and your name doesn't get called right away. Yeah, it's it's a super uncomfortable situation. Honestly, there's so much anxiety behind it because you don't know if you're in or not. I mean, my sophomore year when we went, we were on TV, so we had a feeling that we were going to be called. Um, but when you're just waiting there and – you know, regions are getting, regionals are being created and you're just waiting and waiting and waiting and your name, and you don't see Iowa State, you don't see your name. It is nerve wracking. You're sweating. You kind of a thought goes through your head. Like, are we even getting picked? And it's uncomfortable almost. Um, and the second your name gets called, you can just take a deep breath. Luckily we got called pretty early, but, um, I was feeling for UCF when I was watching selection Sunday, because that's gotta be very uncomfortable. And like you said, when you're in the room and you're just kind of watching it, um, it's, it's not a fun process. Well, especially cause you don't, you don't know the ins and outs of, Oh, well this team can bust here. Right. This can be your you you know, players in. are thinking like, Oh my God, why is that team? in? then right. certainly it doesn't make sense when both FAU and Indiana got in. That's when a lot of people are like, Whoa, somebody here is not going to get in. That's, you know, we thought would get in and mm -hmm. you're right. Those negative minds happen. And then, you know, when that Tallahassee regional comes up, even though I kind of felt confident they were in, you just don't know. There's always a percentage that right. you, you never know. So you're like, you're, I couldn't watch because I couldn't yeah. watch. And, and I'm like, I'm going to wait for hear it. And then, of course, they came up with UCF. Although, and you could, I'm sure Coach Paul Malone will break this up. Beth Mowitz accidentally said Auburn first as a three yeah. seed, which, oh boy, that would, that would have freaked people out. But, you know, it was a mis honest mistake. 
And uh, UCF got in, and I think they're motivated. They know they put themselves in this spot, uh, and there's some some unfinished business from past meetings with Florida State, in particular last year, that, eh, let's just say uh, there's receipts waiting uh, on the back end there. Uh, but UCF obviously gets in as a last four in. It's the second time they've done that, 2012, they did that. I do have a – can we get a, a real quick about what a joke it is that UCF – uh, is a last four. You want to save that for the no. for the Texas? We're talking to UCF. Just go ahead. Just go ahead, right. please. Because I had UCF sixty. I had them sixty. They had FAU. I had them. FAU was not a last four in, which is absolutely laughable to me. Nothing against FAU. I like Jordan Clark's doing a great job. I don't have an issue with them being in the tournament either. I'm going to read you the quick breakdown here. UCF nine top fifty wins. FAU four. UCF. 30th strongest schedule, FAU 99, non-conference schedule strength, UCF 74, FAU 121, our average RPI win, UCF 114, FAU 127, average RPI loss, UCF 24, one of the best in the country, FAU 51, uh, quad threes, UCF 9 and 3, FAU 17 and 7 in quad three. Well, they played on the field, so FAU must have won. Maybe that's what they went with the tiebreaker. Well, they did play, except UCF actually beat them on the field. One to nothing. I called the game, so I recall that. Caitlin Felton with the shutout. What did I just read there that would suggest that FAU is better than UCF? Nothing. Well, they won their they won what they, they won the American regular regular season <clears throat> title. Great. Hey, great. UCF <clears throat> did that the last two years too. No, no, no. So no. congratulations. No, no. I, yeah. I I don't understand the the final teams who got in those last teams right there like the last eight who got in as at larges and the ones left out from a resume standpoint it does the numbers don't make sense if if the only argument the only argument i can come up with is the same thing with indiana well they won 40 games so they must be good and that team didn't win 40 well games. I, and i'm like we'll get to I, it. Yeah. I, I like cool great when you play twice as many quad four teams as the team who didn't win 40, you're going to have more wins. If I play a weaker schedule, a significantly weaker schedule. You back up your point. UCF only played 12 quad four games. FAU played 20. They'll say, hey, the American contributed to that fair, but you also added some in the non-conference. Indiana, who you mentioned, 25 non-quad four games. Penn State, 23 on that. The only metric that I would think they might have used is the KPI, which had FAU at 34, UCF at 40. That's a reference. They didn't use the KPI at any other part of this tournament, brackets, except for this. And I'll, we'll get into it more when Texas Tech, we talk about them. I think there was some politics here, I, Philip, because as you just mentioned, there's nothing on the resume or on the field that suggests that UCF should be behind FAU in the pecking order. None. No, not at all. Okay. Uh, so to wrap this section up, Oklahoma out of Norman, um, who, who, if you're picking right now, who's coming out of Tallahassee to meet OU and Supers? It's a toss up. I really do think you got three teams there that can win the region. I'm going to say this, Chattanooga is not a pushover as a four. Um, this is the first time that Florida State's in a regional where they have the third best pitching staff. Normally they have the best or maybe the second best. They're not as good as the Auburn pitching staff. They're not as good as UCF with Sarah Willis. They have had issues this year on the pitching side. They're the home team, so they should deserve to get to be the favorite. But I'm telling you, I would not be surprised if either Auburn or UCF wins this regional. I think the winner of the Auburn-UCF early game could be a, could watch out for them. Uh, and if I think the key is going to be timely hitting, which has been an issue for UCF this year, been an issue for Auburn. If they could fix some of that, I think you could see an upset in this regional, uh, either with Auburn or UCF over Florida State. But I, I think this is actually one of the more interesting regionals uh, that you, you, I would say it's a toss-up. Yeah, I, I definitely think that Auburn-UCF game, whoever comes out of that, has got a really good shot to get out of that regional. Leah, any any thoughts uh, before we move on from here? Ooh. I just... I think it's going to go to game seven. I hope UCF comes out of that Auburn game and I don't know. It's going to be, it's going to be close. Um, like Eric said, Florida state should have 
you know, the favorite since it's their home field, but I'm not, I'm not impressed with their pitching staff um, lately this year. So it'll be interesting. I obviously, I don't even have a, like, I don't know where my mind's even taking me. Who's going to win this regional. You could have, by the way, maybe the best pitching matchup on Friday. If it happens, we don't know. Both teams could go in a different direction. Right. You could have Maddie Penta against Sarah Willis opening night. That could be put opening day. That could be pretty good. Last year we had Donnie Goldborn against Sarah Willis. We could have Manny Penta against Willis. That would be dynamic. Um, I, I would dare, dare dare anybody to tell me what's a better potential pitching matchup on Friday than that one. If it's it close. happens, if it happens, we don't we won't know until yeah. obviously Friday. Again, both teams have options. One of my high school teammates also plays on Auburn, so it's like it's a t- it's like I got to cheer for them, but then also UCF with Eric. It's it's a toss up. We're friends, Leah. You know, you're Big Twelve blood, and come on, come on. I know. I just hope it's a close game. I hope. Oh, it's definitely. Uh, but no, it'll. Well, well, maybe for you, it'll be blood stressful for me. I'll be there. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh man. Uh, another thing that's also dynamic is Charlie Hustle, where you can go and find some of the absolute best vintage inspired clothing. Look. It, Baseball season's coming to a close. Softball running postseason. If you want to represent your team, your fandom, then go to charliehustle.com. They've got every Big 12 school available. They've got Raglan tees for everyone, which is a perfect baseball softball shirt. You want to try that out. They've got a ton of stuff available, whether you like a Raglan or not. They've got Colorado as well. They've got more Cincinnati. They've got a ton of stuff coming this summer too. They still got stuff on sale. If it's on sale, just enjoy the sale. If it's not on sale, you find some stuff you want. Use our promo code 10 12 15 T E in one two one five or fifteen percent off all non sale items. We love being partnered with Charlie Hustle because they love the Big Twelve. We love that they love the Big Twelve. We want you to support them, you know, partially because they support us, and also because we just think they're fun. They're neat. They're great people. We enjoy being partnered with a company that loves the Big Twelve as much as we do. So, go to charliehustle.com. Check out the absolutely great stuff and super comfortable. I might add, very very comfortable T-shirts and sweaters and joggers and everything else that they've got so go to charliehustle.com use that promo code 10 12 15 for 15 percent off all non-sale items charlie hustle vintage they were in uh in oklahoma city are the the they were there eric did they have did they have a, a table set up were they selling some gear i probably so i mean i had my own booth so i wasn't oh. you know, i was locked in in my own yeah you know, i had my own personal booth Every day, hanging out with Natasha Wally and Madison Shipman and company. So, you know, I was a little busy myself. Eric, I don't, I don't know if you drink. We've never talked about this. Did you Did you try the Iron Monk, the beer that they made just for the uh, the I party? didn't fi- – no, I didn't. Like, I was running around and, like, they were – I did see them out there. But, no, I didn't get a chance. I got to tell you, man, when you're at that tournament, it goes by quick. And it's like – there's, like, a hundred things going on. But I think – I did see Charlie Hustle, though. They had a big camp there. Uh, everybody there. So and it, it was pretty cool. See, this is why we need Leah to come. Leah could have covered some of this stuff and helped me out. I'm getting FOMO just hearing about all this stuff. So next year, next- Leah's going to be our, our 10, 12 woman on the, on the street. She's going to try the drinks, the food. I'll bring a mini mic. Get the, yes, perfect. You can interview fans and, uh, and players and such. It'll be great. It'll be great. Leah, Leah I, didn't, I didn't let anybody out in my booth. It was a D1 softball booth. I'll make the exception for it. Oh. Let's go. Come. Ooh. Let's go. We're like that because we're like this. You let Ashton right. in the booth. Right. Ashton was in there with you for sure. Oh, well, for, no, 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 no. Hold on. Liar. He, was he was there for the pregame, oh. but then he went to the neck to the regular media oh, press box. Regular. Which, in, in his defense, it's behind home plate. It's a heck of a view, actually. <laughs> so he's okay, smart. He's a, <laughs> he's a lot smarter than me, to be honest. He's got the home plate view. I've got a, like an up, a pretty view. So trust me, he. Uh, Ashton I don't know. Smart. From what you were posting, it looked like you had a pretty good view. Yeah. Did, did oh, you yeah, have no, a, I, Did I, you I, have I, a view from the stadium of the stadium of the games? From live there? Okay, you had a great view. All right, uh, moving on. Uh, (laughs) Oklahoma State getting the number five seed. They'll be hosting in Stillwater as a top eight seed for the, what is this, the fourth time in a row, I believe, if I recall correctly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 2019, they did it. Okay, so uh, they are getting Northern Colorado, Michigan, and Kentucky. Um, Look, I think OSU got a tough draw here between getting Michigan and Kentucky. I don't know anything about Northern Colorado. I'm gonna be blunt. I, I you, you could, you, I, I know that they're uh, a bear logo. I just, I haven't spent a lot of time on on the Big West Conference. I'm sorry, I do my best. It's a lot. Did I mention I have three children? Uh, this is a tough 
this is a tough regional for Oklahoma State. Not that I don't think that they can handle it. I, I Look, we saw Oklahoma State last year. They struggled down the stretch, lost in the first round of the Big 12 tournament, and went into a regional against a Wichita State team that they had struggled with, and they rolled through the regional with no problem. I, I believe in Oklahoma State and Kenny Gajewski when it gets to the postseason. He's, they've proven time and time again. It's a whole new season. They know what they're doing. They'll be prepared. And Lexi Kilfoyle has been – in the big games, the big games – that team is really, really good. And we'll just assume that they got their worst postseason game out of them with five errors against BYU. Uh, so Kentucky and Michigan's tough. They're going to be at home. They may only have to see one of them, right? So I, it's going to be a tough regional, but I, I feel fairly confident in Oklahoma State to get out of it, Eric. Well, ESPN agrees with you because they're sending Malins, uh, Smith, yeah. and Mendoza to that regional. So with Holly, so you're you're getting that regional TV. It's the marquee TV regional because it's got a lot of star power. Here's my concern about Oklahoma State: is the health of the pitching staff. Ivy Rosenberry is not 100. percent They're clearly limited. Acock seems to be out of the you know. Tr- favor right now or whatever not trust i don't know how you would describe it philip with with her where she's at right now so i it, with a regional like this michigan has a couple of good arms kentucky's got a good arm this is probably going to go seven oak state's going to have to score some runs and play better defense than they did against byu they're capable of that but i my concern for oak state in the postseason is the health of this pitching staff do they have enough behind Kilfoyle to get through the, not just this regional, but I'm saying for the during the whole this postseason run. Yeah, and Michigan and Kentucky have been playing some good softball, and I think people forget like it's not just one or two games. Like these girls have to play a lot, and they have to be um, focused for super regionals. So you don't want to look too far ahead, but like you got super regionals are important. World Series is important, so you have to you got to keep your pitchers healthy. But at the same time, you got to win games. You want to keep your season alive. I'm with you, Eric. I don't know. I feel like they're kind of coming off of a tough loss against BYU. Again, Oklahoma State's a different breed in postseason. They've been there before. This isn't something new to them. So it'll be interesting, but I think they have a tough regional. Um, It should be interesting. And if Holly Rose there, then you know it's going to be good. Oh, yeah. It's It's my girl. It's going to be to to get the A-plus group. I mean, look, I I think you can throw Acock out there against Northern Colorado. Hope that you get the win with her. And then you've got Lexi for and and and, and Ivy to, to hopefully close things out. And if you can get done in three, you're gonna feel real good. Like if you can get done in three, you're feeling really good. So I it is a it is a tough regional. Um it's gonna be really interesting to see who wins that Kentucky Michigan matchup. But if Oklahoma State's bats are hitting the way they have and knocking it out of the park. I think they're going to be okay. Be they're going right. to be very aggressive. They are matched up opposite number 12 seed Arkansas, who has Villanova, uh, Southeast Missouri, and future Big 12 member Arizona in a very interesting regional there. Arkansas and Arizona actually met up during the uh, non-conference slate. I think they split two games between each other. Interesting note here, Oklahoma State and Arkansas were supposed to meet in Supers last year. As the 6th and 11th seed, Arkansas got upset by Oregon in Arkansas's mm-hmm. regional in Fayetteville. And so we didn't get OSU-Arkansas in Supers last year. Do we get it this year? Does, does this another upset happen? Does OSU not make it out? Does Arkansas lose to Arizona? We've already seen Arizona beat Arkansas once. Or are we going to get Arizona? Are, are we going to get the Super we were we thought last year, this year, just a year later? I am uh, I'm rooting for an Oklahoma State-Arkansas Super Regional. Because there is, I know for a fact, there's a little, I don't know what the good word is. No, there is. A little, there is. Because Arkansas <laughs> you know no, because Arkansas won't schedule OSU during the season. All right, Phil, all right, Philip said it for me. Thank you. That was Philip, not me. Thank you. No, I'll say it. Correct. So I want that to happen. But I will say this. Oklahoma State, Arizona is a consolation. Ain't a bad either. If So give me any of those. I'm excited. That. Fayetteville Regional is fascinating with Arkansas and Arizona. They played earlier this year in Arizona. I think they split. That one will Mm -hmm. probably go seven. Villanova is a scrappy three. Both Arkansas and Arizona have questions pitching as well, so we might see some offense there at Bogle. I'll stick with Arkansas because they're at home, and I am selfishly want to see Oklahoma State, Arkansas, see those two coaching staffs. Uh, Have to shake hands. Yeah. 
I love the way Arkansas plays, so I'm rooting for Oklahoma State, Arkansas. I don't, I, and I know someone on Arkansas too. Of course you do. You got, you know, Leah just knows everyone. Leah, you need to, you know, all these relationships. You got to start reaching out and getting a little info, getting us a little behind the scenes detail here. Be a little spy for us. Let me see what I can okay? do. Let me little, see what I can do. I just, I <laughs> look, I, 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 I know that our OSU has tried many times. I think they finally stopped trying because Arkansas just doesn't want to schedule. Don't Kenny, know why. Kenny. What's great about Kenny called him out on my show, on my interview. Like, just, yeah, they don't want to play us. I want to play everybody. Um, yeah, so give me that. I want to see that. I want the drama. I want both, because then what's going to happen is, I know what's going to happen. If they play, both coaches are going to get asked about them playing in the future. You know what Kenny's going to say? I'm all for it. Let's do it. It's them. Let's do it. And so, oh, baby. And no, uh, just, let's. He'll put all the pressure uh, on, uh, on Arkansas. But not. And I'm friends with both staff, so I'm not picking sides. I'm just saying I just like the drama. Give me the drama. I mean, I'm picking sides. I'm also of the like, hey, you're close to each other. Shut up and schedule each other. Like, it's not – it's a – stop it. Stop it. That's ridiculous. Uh, okay. So how do we – feel? what are we feeling? We, we want OSU Arkansas. Are we feeling OSU Arkansas? Yes. yes. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. I, I do too. I like Arizona if they're if – they're, Pitchers were healthy. If, if their top pitchers were healthy, Arizona would be hosting a regional this year right now. Like, agreed, agreed. Uh, future we're a Big Twelve team too. There, uh, that uh, mm-hmm. I think next year you look at next year, not to look ahead. I think Arizona's heading in the right direction. This was a good year for Caitlin Lowe, considering all the injuries to get back to the tournament. Uh, a team that, if they would have made a run in the Pac twelve tournament, might have had a shot to host. I think they'll be even better next year. So, you know, keep that in mind for next season. And if we get Oklahoma State, Arizona in the Supers, you can make the argument that, that might be the top two preseason teams in next year's Pick 12 preseason poll. I mean, I don't know who you would pick over them unless someone has a massive influx or something. I just, I don't, like, I, I think those are your top two. I mean, it's going to, because Baylor's going to be young. Baylor's going to be young. UCF's young, like Utah, I guess, but I, I think Arizona would get picked over Utah. Uh, would be yeah, Utah is so up and down. Texas Tech should continue to rise. But I think, I think, I mean, unless OSU, we have major questions about pitching because obviously they're going to lose Ivy and Lexi. Like, I think it's OSU and, and Arizona, your preseason one and two, and it's a question of which one you prefer. All right. Uh, the other Big 12 team we've got to talk about is Baylor, who is headed to Lafayette to play in the Louisiana Regional, a team they've already played three games against this season and won two of in Lafayette. First, they have to get past Ole Miss. Oh, by the way, we talked about teams that have seen each other a lot in postseason. Baylor and Ole Miss faced (laughs) off as the two versus three (laughs) last year at the Regional in Utah, and now we'll be doing it in Louisiana. Because why not? Why not? (laughs) So I don't think I ever told you my conspiracy theory about last year, right? Oh, okay. Because Baylor should have hosted last year. <clears throat> or Louisiana should have hosted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think Louisiana was going to host, but Utah won the Pac-12 title, so they flipped it, and Utah got to see uh, Ole Miss and Baylor, which, wow, what a coincidence. They're now in Louisiana Lafayette because they both can bust. So <laughs> man, that kind of backs up that kind of backs up my conspiracy theory there. Uh, as far as the regional for Baylor – this season for Baylor is a what if, and I talked to Glenn Moore obviously this week at the Big Twelve tournament. If they're fully healthy, they would have been an easy host, easy yeah, host, like yeah. top ten host type ability. They got Bidford and they got Crandall. They're gonna have to depend on those two arms. That's all they got. Or arm is done, from what I'm told. Uh, she just they got nothing left there, and obviously they had the suspension with Wilson and everything. They got by UCF and then they got destroyed by uh uc uh by texas i don't you know i think the matchup with old miss they can handle i just don't know if they can win a region with just those two arms against louisiana at their place it's not a bad shot for baylor i think binford's the key binford has to be the best player in this regional for them to get out of this region and she's capable of that she was the best player in the ucf game not only with her pitching i think she had like double digit strikeouts i remember that because i was there that was rough to watch from a ucf standpoint but she also hit a home run in the game if she raises her game to that level they can win this regional but that means you may have to do it two or three times because you don't have the depth arms wise so they need to get off to a good start it's a must win for them against old miss Opening day. I don't believe they can come out of a loser's bracket with the lack of depth they have pitching now. No, they're, they're, 
They're going to have to go no. two and zero to start off with. I, I, re- I really think they have to be sitting there two and zero in the in the driver's seat for the the final day. Sorry, Leah, go ahead. No, that I was uh, agree with everything you guys just said. Eric took the words right out of my mouth. I, I'm nervous with their pitching staff. Benford is incredible. She can get game one. She can they can beat Ole Miss. I say she, but like Baylor can do it. But again, Benford has to be the star. Um, but it's just how is she going to recover and be able to help out because she's I she's going to have to go in the sec- that second game to help pitch as well. I'm and she also is an offensive stick. She has to do it all, and it's going to be a long recovery and it's a long weekend. And so if they have enough arm, they could win this regional. But it's going to be tooth and nails. It's going to be hard. Somebody other than Govin, too, has to hit. Somebody right, other than right. Govin has to hit because they're going to pitch around Govin. She's amazing. Uh, Glenn Moore admitted he didn't throw Benford in the Texas game because he didn't want her to risk any injury, have her fresh for the regional. So. Which makes sense. Yeah. But then it's like you can't you can't continue to do that because – No, he, I, you know, I, 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 think, I think he did that on purpose. He wanted to get that one win in, and I think you'll see a lot of Benford and Crandall yeah. basically split every game moving forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's going to be interesting for them. Like, I, I here's a question: Do you? I mean, do you do you just not have Benford hit? Do you just cut back on on her offense? I think they need her. They need the bat. Yeah, they I was going to say, bat. especially if you're going to walk Shaylin every single time. Uh, yeah, not yeah. I just you you. I mean, you just don't get enough offense from anybody else in that lineup this year to to not have. Have her Especially head. with Wilson, all, uh, you know, done with the right. team. Now, Strain's done, Strain's done a good job replacing her, but she was the table setter for the offense. She gets on, Govin usually drives her in. That was the that was the bread and butter for Baylor offense. Man, this is just a second straight year of what could have been for Baylor. And I, I, I really yeah. hate it for them because it's two straight years of coming in and, and injuries and issues have just I – mean, You've still had good seasons, but have derailed what could have been really, really good years and setting up for for some potentially. They, would, they could have been a. They could have been a World Series contender easily. Yeah. Uh, their health. Yeah, hate it. Uh, we'll see what they do. I mean, again, they've they've seen Louisiana three times this season. Granted, it was a lot earlier in the year, but they took two of three away on the road last time, so they're not going to be phased being back there in Lafayette if they can get past an Ole Miss team that I mean is really good one day and. Not the next. They they were good enough and had enough big games to be able to get into the postseason. Uh, Eric's had to walk away for a moment, so we're, that's okay. We're gonna we're gonna start the tangent anyways because we're gonna talk about Ole Miss. Ole Miss got in. Shocker. Ole Miss. Like I, I'm gonna say this. I'm not upset that the SEC got everyone in this year. The SEC was good. Everybody was top fifty in the RPI, like top forty in the RPI. Like it was a really good year for the SEC. They did a, they did a, enough in the non-conference to boost the entire conference up. And then once you get into conference play, there's no quad three games on the schedule. You don't have a quad three. You don't have. There was no. You know, comparing to the the Big Twelve, there was no Houston. There was no Iowa State. There was no BYU who was fluctuating back and forth between quad two, quad three. They didn't have any of that on the schedule. And so everyone got in. And I think Ole Miss. I mean, Ole Miss was one of the last four in, but they were boosted by the conference as a whole. It is a good conference. They got all got a lot of good players. The fact that they get in all the teams all the time also helps get re- helps in recruit. If you know you can go to an SEC school and you're probably going to get into the postseason, it's easy to go to an SEC school. And mm-hmm. when you have the money the SEC has, you can invest more in sports like softball and baseball and so on and so forth that not everyone else can invest right. into. So, like, there is a reason that the SEC is good. Yes, there is a bias, but there is some evidence to back it up. All right, all of that aside, the rest of these shenanigans are just. <sighs> Because I don't understand. You look at Texas Tech. I, 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 that they got left out. If we want to talk about FAU as a mid-major, okay, that's fine. I, I know that, that Eric, it bothers Eric that FAU got in over, not that they got in, but they got in over Texas Tech. Indiana. Indiana. And this is my whole, like, it must be because they got 40 wins and they cared about the number of wins. Indiana went 40 and 18. Texas Tech went 29 and 21. Uh, Texas Tech obviously didn't have the three games against Iowa State in the regular season. Maybe they would have gone three and zero. It wouldn't have helped the RPI. Let's look at the let's look at the resumes with Indiana, a team in the Big Ten, the fifth best conference this year. Maybe 
Maybe the sixth. I can make an argument the Sun Belt was a better conference than the Big Ten. So let's put them in sixth. Being generous. Uh, somehow I got four teams in. Indiana. Let's go through this. Strength of schedule. Comparison between Indiana and Texas Tech. Overall. Just overall strength of schedule. Indiana 82. Texas Tech 25. Non-conference. The one you can control. It's not Indiana's fault. The Big Ten was bad this year. It's not their fault. Their non-conference schedule. 140th. Texas Tech was 91st. You say, well, it's 91st isn't very good. A, it's hard to get teams to come to Texas Tech. You know, Craig Snyder is going to continue to work on that. And Craig was going to come on. Coach Snyder was going to come on the show because we assumed Texas Tech would be in the field. And then when they weren't, I offered him the opportunity to to, to not have to come on and talk because I understand that they're feeling a lot of emotions right now. And so I wasn't going to make him come on and talk about what happened. That just seemed mean. Last year's non-conference for Texas Tech was like two something, like 230. He got that one up. They are working to improve this. So they've done the things that they have to do from an, an RPI standpoint by non-conference schedule. Okay, top 25 wins. Indiana 0 and 5, Texas Tech 2 and 14. Top 50. Let's do top 50. 7 and 14 for Indiana, 8 and 19 for Texas Tech. You also notice the number there. Uh let's talk quad three. They were both eight and one. Quad four. Quad four record. That is 101. And down in RPI. Texas Tech was 13 and 1. Indiana was 25 and 3. I don't understand. Even if four spots apart in RPI, I don't understand what Indiana did this season. And I don't want to hear about the Big Big Ten tournament. If the conference isn't any good, I don't care what you did in the tournament because you didn't do anything in a conference tournament that's any good. I don't understand how you look at those two teams and say, Indiana, yes, Texas Tech, no. I don't. I don't understand it. I, it, it does. It, it is baffles my mind. Well let, me, well, let me explain it to you then, if you would oh, like. I would, I could please, explain it I would love an explanation. <laughs> so, there's a cult, the thing called a committee, correct? Uh, yeah. Who is in this committee? You want to know who? I have the list. Go ahead, read Hold it. On, I got to well, I got to <laughs> you you queued me up before I can pull it up. Okay. Uh, uh we have uh chair of the committee is Kurt McGuffin of UT Martin. He's the athletic director. Good guy. Yep. Uh yep, fine. no problem there. SEC has a rep, Tennessee Sports Admin Tara Brooks who replaced former Missouri AD who's now at Arizona cuz she had to leave off the well, okay. because she it's fine. Oh, Okay. Uh That's fine. No problem. Clemson senior or uh, associate AD is Natalie Honan. Uh Christy Breadbenner, head coach Wichita State. Hmm. Let's push that to the side. Ooh, okay. Uh, Montana head coach, Melanie uh, Mutual, if I pronounce that right. Okay. Uh, Brian sure. Coles, Pacific head coach. Is he still the head coach? Was Pacific one? Cozy. He just retired Cozy. from Pacific. Just retired. retired. Okay. Uh, hmm. Senior associate AD at Western Michigan, uh, Keena Smith. Okay. I still check. That's a Midwest school, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sandra Rocker, Roker, okay. UMass Fair. Lowell, yeah. uh, okay. SWA. Yeah. I think I have. Oh, yeah. Louisiana Lafayette, SWA, Jessica Legger. And uh, okay. Northwestern assistant AD Jane Wagner. Huh. What conference are they? Oh, that's the uh, Big Ten, right? Big Ten. Oh. Yeah. Hey, you know what conference I didn't mention? What was that? Big 12. <gasps> You're right. How did that happen? What is... In fact, Pink, Coach Pink was the last Big 12 rep yeah. here on the board. Did his four-year run. Yep, yep, yep. Interesting, isn't it? Hmm. Hmm. Mm. Some mid majors, some Big Ten, no Pac twelve, Big Twelve. Now, in fairness, uh, this is they rotate this the stuff. This wasn't like, hey, let's let's lo- not give the key to the Big Twelve so they don't get into the room. It wasn't any of that. I've been told by sources that next year there will be a Big Twelve representative. Somebody else from another conference will not. I don't know who that is, but in my opinion, based on what you just said, there were some politics there. They wanted to get some big tickets. Big Ten teams have complained about being shafted last year or whatever. I think there was some retribution there. They had an opportunity for retribution, which is actually why I had four Big Ten teams in my field. Not because I think they should get four. I just had a feeling when I saw the committee that eh, this seems like a big four, a Big Ten friendly kind of a committee, which turned out to be correct. And they'll probably use KPI, which was created by... Uh, Kevin Paga, who is was on the show, is a good guy. I like him. Works at, used to work at it, the Big Ten. So um, I think that was politics, and they decided 
instead of picking on the little guy in FAU, because if they did that, the media's like, whoa, I can't believe you left the little guy that won 40 plus games. How dare you? Oh, the power conferences. They decided to pick on a conference that wasn't rep- was going to be debated there in the Big 12, and it turned out to be Texas Tech that they uh, decided to pluck away there and put the Big Ten teams in and put FAU, so that way the mid-majors are happy, the Big Ten's happy, and hey, the Big 12's not happy, but you know what? They got, We could just say that they got, they're got blowed out by Texas, so that's why they're not in. Give me a break. Dang. The more t- you know... The more you know, the now you know. So, am I right? <laughs> Tell me if I'm wrong, Philip. Tell me what 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 did I say there that, that, that does not make sense there? I mean, look, if someone wants to say it's just a conspiracy theory nonsense, that's fine. But these are human beings. Um, I don't think it's conspiracy. No, 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 I, I think conspiracy. I don't, I don't either. I don't. Yeah. Um, I, it, this is you think about what people are going to respond to this with. Um, you can say, "Woo, I don't care." Texas Tech should have won more games. They should have been blown out by Texas. If Indiana well, but, but, had but, played but, Texas, Indiana would have had their asses blown too. I shouldn't have worded it that way. I'm real sorry. Um, immediate regret. Uh, <laughs> look, I, you, and look, I like KPI. And we've we've referenced KPI a lot. And Indiana is higher than Texas Tech in the KPI. They're not in the RPI. Uh, let me pull up, uh, let's pull up Diamond Sport. Is Indiana, Indiana's ahead of Texas Tech in Diamond Sport. Indiana is really high. What is that about? That is not yeah. remotely accurate. Here, Here's the deal. The things that they seem to care about didn't matter when it came to this point. Correct. Including schedule strength. The most important one, the most consistent one that the committees have always pushed was that. And yet you picked basically two teams in Indiana and FAU that have much weaker schedules than Texas Tech. FAU could say, hey, we're not in the American, all that. Not, it just isn't. And it telling you, and listen, in fairness, there's years past where I'm sure the Big 12 has benefited. The like, politicking happens in when? every sport committee. Hold up. Hold. Oh, okay. Let's play this game. And I know that that, that you're not anti-Big 12. I just, no. I have said this year after year. Like, the Big 12 doesn't get credit for OU being in the conference because OU beats everybody. And so, well, you should have been more competitive with OU. The SEC, well, all these teams are more competitive with those top teams. It's the same problem this year. Like, well, they weren't competitive with Texas. Yeah, lots of teams weren't competitive with Texas. Like, I, I yeah. get it. I just, the, the the teams at the top of the Big 12 are good. We can play all the, like, I understand that the investments out there is in other conferences. I understand that da 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 We can explain the reasons that the Big 12 is not as good as insert other conference and their teams here and there. That's fine. Cool. There has, in my opinion, been a bias against Big 12 teams because they are unable to compete and with and beat Oklahoma on a ever, period. End of story. Like, you might get a win here or there. We literally right. talked about how amazing it was that somebody won a series from Tech OU this season. I Now you have Texas, who is as good as they were. And I it's when, they, when teams can't get those wins because it's really hard to do because of how good Texas and Oklahoma were, you don't get the credit for it. Which is also like, I get BYU leading left out, but you look at both Texas Tech and BYU among the last four, and it's kind of like, well, we'll just put them in the last one. Here, you did a nice job. Here, you get to have your name there and, and feel bad because you didn't get in. Because I can make an argument that Indiana and BYU, like, BYU has... Yeah, eight top 50 wins for BYU, three top 25 wins. They beat Oklahoma State twice, beat Oklahoma. Obviously, the BYU thing, the one glaring thing that they're clearly going to use on that one is the schedule, strength, yes. non-conference, 173. That's why I didn't have BYU in. But that wasn't Texas Tech's problem. That's a BYU issue. By the way, I want to clarify. I didn't mean Big 12 got advantages in softball. I'm saying like in sports in general. I'm sure there's a basketball committee one year where the Big 12 got benefited in politic to get a baby like Kansas, get a higher C or somebody in the Big 12. I'm, I'm just throwing generic. That's fine. I'm not saying my point is there's always going to be politics in college sports committees. So you're never going to be perfect. So I, I just, I don't think this was just a one year, like this all of a sudden it's like, Hey, let's go after these group this year. I think there's probably been politics all over the place. We're just more emphasizing it now because we have more information out there, which is a good thing. And again, I think the committee overall did a good job, but this was went against everything they did all the rest of this bracket. And it's unfortunate for Craig Snyder and Texas Tech because they probably thought with that last regional 
in College Station, because I had him projected to go to College Station, even though that's a flight. I had him going there. He, They probably thought, okay, we'll get College Station, worst case scenario. And then when Penn State pops up, there's probably – and that, that stinks. That's terrible. And that's – they don't deserve that. Look, yes, when you're in the last four-in premise there, you could have done more. I think they'd be the first to tell you they could have done more. But you know what? So could have Indiana. So could have FAU. So everybody else could have done more as well. Yeah, I, I didn't have a problem with Penn State. And I don't really have a bigger problem with Florida Atlantic. Like, I, yeah. I'm, I'm giving you a little more credit because you won your conference the regular Penn, season. Penn State, hold, and let me, Penn State, who were given a free pass, and that's fine, lost to Maryland in the quad four in the opening round of the Big Ten tournament. Lost to them twice. They lost two out of three to Rutgers quad three at the end as well. You could have easily made a case to bump them out if you wanted to uh, as well. So I, I think, to me, that's what's egregious is I would have I had Texas Tech in over Indiana and FAU easily. You could have made a case for Texas Tech against Penn State as well uh, based on how Penn State finished the season. Because some people were are texting me, well, the reason Texas Tech's out is because how they finished the year. Penn State finished awful. What are you talking about? So – I think that's unfair. Like you're basically saying, well, because they had to play Texas at the end. That's yeah. That's why they finished bad because they're playing the number one team in the country. Maybe Texas, if Texas Tech plays Kansas instead, does that mean they're in? Like, come on, give me a break. Penn State had four quad four losses. <laughs> they went twenty two and four in quad four. They had nine losses against teams fifty one or lower in the RPI. Texas Tech had two. I just, I, I, it's tough. It's really hard. It's really hard. And it's hard to hear them be the last four out because I almost wish they wouldn't have said that if I'm being honest, Oh, it's a tough pill to swallow. There's you start racking the whole season and seeing who, like what they could have done differently. And then to have their resumes compared to teams that they're clearly better than it burns even more. It's, Louisville was one of the last four out. 27 and 25. By the way. 50th yeah. in the RPI, Louisville. Yeah. But, so remember Christy Breadbanner I mentioned? Put it yeah. Aside? How is Wichita State a last four, uh, uh, last four out? <laughs> Kansas beat them twice. Kansas blows them away in the race. Hey, look. Kansas blew it. Yeah. yeah. Okay? So yes. nobody feels sorry. They, they, I mean, I do. They I just, hate it. it. I, it's, I, I hate it, too. But that they... That's why they're like, but they should have been a first four out over Wichita State. Come on, please. What are we doing here? Uh, it, I hate it for Texas Tech. Um, I, I, if there's a takeaway for Texas Tech, and I hate it that we have to like, what's what's the lesson to learn here? It's you're just you're gonna have to get you not big 12 teams outside of Oklahoma, Texas and, and Oklahoma state now are not getting the benefit of the doubt when it comes to selection committee for the postseason. The big 12 just is not getting the, the benefit of the doubt. They don't. And it's nonsense. And maybe it'll help to have a big 12 rep next year. Maybe they'll get a little bit more of the benefit of the doubt. That would be nice. I think it will. I think it will. I think it will. It'll, you know, new league. We'll see, but uh, no, look, but, I sense your frustration and I, I can't disagree. I with just it. like, you've got to start operating under the assumption. Like we are not going to get the benefit of the doubt. We're going to have to, we're going to have to do more. I also think you're going to have to, as big 12 teams, like there's going to be more pressure to put together stronger non-conference schedules moving forward. Like this is I, I get so why but why is that applied here and not the Big Ten teams? I don't know. It's, it's because poor Big Ten. They it's cold. They can't play softball. It's hard up there. Where it's cold <laughs> and snowy in winter. It's it's not fair for them that they're in the cold in the cold. That's why wrestling is the number three sport for them. It's the one they care the most about. They don't. It's not. It's not a softball conference. It's fine. <sighs> All right. This is great. This is fun. Um, we've got Cindy Baum alone. She's coming up next. We've got postseason coming up. It's going to be so much fun. Uh, I'll say this. This is not our last softball episode. We'll probably have one more. Uh, depending upon how, look, every Big 12 team loses in regionals. We won't have to come back and talk about it anymore. I don't think that's happening. That, if that happens, we, if that happens, boy, we got a big story. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, okay. I'm just going to immediately move on to uh, football. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think we'll get together probably one more time uh, before we get into Supers and, and, and the Women's College World Series because – this cannot be, this will not be our goodbye. So uh, you will hear from Eric and Leah again 
And you can continue to hear from them, Eric, on In the Circle Podcast, on Sons of UCF. And of course, Eric, plug the socials so everybody knows where to follow you if they're not already. Which, if you're not already, what are you doing? I mean, uh, every podcast is someone's first. What are first. you doing? I'll every tell you what, though. Is someone's Here, first, I forget. Clearly, the word spread because I got over 100 followers today. It was nuts, man. Let's, Let's go. go. Let's What are we doing? Uh, I, I guess just put out bracket stuff. Uh, Eric Lopez Elo, that's where you can find me there. D1 Softball, that's where the bracketology stuff I do normally. Got 63 out of 64. The one I missed was, of course, I had Texas Tech in. Uh, I did not have FAU uh, in in that scenario. I did nail all 16 regionals in pretty much really my best seating year. In the circle on D1 Softball, we're going to have full coverage throughout the postseason. We're going to have that there. D1 Softball is going to have coverage from now all the way to the World Series in person. It's going to be great. And uh, I'll be covering UCF probably in Tallahassee this weekend. So I've got a nice four-hour bus ride that they love so much in this committee and the sport of the NCAA. We're at 400 miles. I, I will actually literally count each mile just to remind to make sure it's 400 just so we don't get in trouble. Because uh, apparently in 2024, you can't fly. Um, but So we got all that. Oh, and much more. I'm sure I'm doing stuff that I'm forgetting. But just go to Eric lopez for all the latest. And I, I get the feeling Leah might be watching some softball this weekend and might share some thoughts on her social. Probably her yeah. TikTok. Uh, maybe her her family <laughs> will join her on TikTok again so that she will uh, people will watch it. Yep. Um, <laughs> yep. <laughs> but, Leah, where can everybody follow you? You got to just type in Leah CJ 21 or Leah CJ 12. It's one or the other. On all the social medias. You're going to either find her or someone else who's also named Leah. Right. And maybe they are also. I'm just going to see. We, you need, Softball. That's what you need to do. You just need to find out who is the other Leah. 21, 21 or 12. Or 12 <laughs> and befriend them. That would be just. I need to just change it to so they're all the same. Oh, yeah. I just, we'll start We'll start Leah, Leah CJ podcast. That's what it is. You and all the Leahs. Yeah. It'd be great. It's perfect. All right. Uh, thank you, Leah. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Shap Charlie Hustle. Podcast Network.